Hi everybody, thanks for joining me yet again as I continue to analyze Reasonable Faith by William Lane Craig one chapter at a time from my own atheist perspective. In this video I'm going to go over chapter 4, The Problem of Miracles. Are miracles even possible? This is the question that William Lane Craig poses for himself in this chapter. He describes this, this uh, skepticism about miracles as one of the major stumbling blocks to becoming a Christian for many people today. And he specifically mentions the miracles supposedly performed by Jesus that we find described in uh, the New Testament. And he says, quote, But the problem is that these sorts of miraculous events seem to belong to a worldview foreign to modern man, a pre-scientific, superstitious worldview belonging to the ancient and middle ages. And I actually agree with everything in that quote except the word seem. Craig dismisses attempts by some modern theologians to fashion a form of Christianity that can be accepted without having to believe in miracles. Uh, such non-miraculous versions of Christianity are not very palatable to Craig because they would rule out the resurrection of Christ which would mean Christians would have no reason to hope for immortality. And we couldn't have that, could we? <laughs> this is wish thinking at its most palpable and pernicious. He makes no bones about it at all. The non-miraculous versions of Christianity are not acceptable because without miracles there's no resurrection and with no resurrection there's no immortality. It has nothing to do with whether it's true or not, whether it's more rational to believe. Nope, it's not the way Craig wants it. He needs his afterlife. He needs his immortality. Craig opens the chapter as always with a look at the historical background of the subject and this time he does this in two parts. First he examines the arguments against miracles posed by uh, deist thinkers in uh, the Enlightenment and he says quote although deists accepted the existence of God his conservation of the world in being and his general revelation in nature they strenuously denied that he had revealed himself in any special way in the world they were therefore very exercised to demonstrate the impossibility of the of the occurrence of miracle or at least of the identification of miracle and what bothers me about that quote is Craig makes it sound like the deists just up and decided one day that miracles didn't happen and then they created arguments to defend this arbitrary contention of theirs in fact as Craig himself is about to point out by summarizing some of their most influential arguments Deists like uh, Spinoza and Hume were basing their rejection of miracles on their observations of nature, on the general lack of evidence for the occurrence of miracles, and on an understanding of the problems that would be involved in demonstrating that miracles had occurred, even assuming that it were possible for them to occur. In other words, their rejection of miracles was a conclusion that they arrived at through a rational process, not something that they asserted first as a principle and then sought to support. That's how Craig works. That's not how Spinoza or Hume worked. Since Craig does attempt to refute these deist arguments for most of the chapter, I will summarize them briefly here. First, Craig describes Newtonian physics and the world machine established by Newton's uh, identification of the, the laws of nature, how the world operates according to set laws and it requires no divine intervention in order to work. And it was this model establishing this framework that allowed deists to then enter and argue that God's direct action in the world is not necessary and in fact doesn't happen. He begins with Spinoza and Spinoza's rejection of miracles comes in two parts. First, Spinoza argues that the laws of nature are the result of God's will. The, they are what they are because they are determined by God's nature. And any event, therefore, that contradicted the laws of nature, that is, a miracle, would be an instance of nature contradicting God, which Spinoza found to be impossible by definition because nature is the very reflection of God, so nature can never contradict God. And then second, Spinoza considered that constant order of natural laws 
to be a proof of God's existence. Therefore, to Spinoza, any interruption in this constant order in the form of a miracle would actually be a proof against the existence of God since it would undermine that principle that the laws of nature were the result of God's will and were therefore incontrovertible and that their very incontrovertibility suggested the existence of a God that had established them and uh, enabled them and was sustaining them. Spinoza also proposed that uh, occurrences which appear to be miracles to us are in fact actually natural events occurring in accordance with natural laws which man has just not yet discovered. The things look like they're miracles but that's a function of the limits of our knowledge not of those events actually breaking the laws of nature. On now to Hume's arguments. Hume argues that it is impossible to prove whether or not a miracle has occurred and therefore it never makes sense to assume that a given event is a miracle. And his argument is divided into two halves. First there is the in principle argument where he argues that it is uh, impossible to establish with total certainty that a given occurrence is a miracle because no matter how conclusive the proof offered for that event being a miracle that proof will always have to stand against the equally conclusive evidence that the laws of nature are immutable and that miracles cannot happen. So even if you have virtually certain proof that a miracle has occurred, the best you can ever achieve is a perfect balance between the possibility of that being a miracle and the immutable laws of nature. And it's if it's 50-50, and given that the laws of nature we know are never violated and never broken and the universe always operates according to them, Hume argues that even in the best case scenario for the miracle it never makes sense to assume that a given event is a miracle as opposed to a natural event. And furthermore, Hume argues that because the probability of miracles occurring is so incredibly low given how uh, constant we know the laws of nature to be, that it makes sense to consider any alternative hypothesis explaining a possible miracle as a natural event, no matter how preposterous, no matter how implausible, before explaining it as a miracle, because no matter how extraordinary and no matter how unlikely the natural explanation may be, any event allowed by the laws of nature is more likely to have occurred than an event prohibited by them. So it never makes sense to Hume to assume that something is a miracle. The other half of Hume's argument is the in fact argument, where Hume argues that uh, the in principle uh, arguments aside, in reality, the evidence offered for miracles is actually nowhere near compelling enough for his in principle arguments to even come into force. And Hume has four reasons for doubting claims of miracles. Uh, he says miracles are never well attested by educated and honest people who would have something to lose if they were found to be lying about a, a, a miracle. Uh, people are naturally credulous and open to believing in stories of miracles as attested by the large number of claimed miracles that have been believed only to be proven false. Miracles tend overwhelmingly to occur in primitive, less civilized, less educated cultures. And all religions cite the supposed occurrence of miracles to demonstrate their authenticity, which leaves us with contradictory claims which mostly cancel each other out. Now to counter these deist arguments against miracles, Craig summarizes the Christian arguments of apologists Jean Leclerc, Samuel Clark, uh, Jacob Vernet, Claude Francois Houteville, Thomas Sherlock, Gottfried Less, and William Paley. And I'm not going to go through their specific arguments individually. I'm just going to share with you Craig's uh, summary of their arguments at which he presents after he has gone through them individually in the chapter. Uh, in summary, these various Christian apologists argue for miracles and against the cases uh, of Spinoza and, and Hume against miracles by arguing that uh, the laws of nature reflect the regular pattern of God's will, but that he is free to choose to alter or suspend those laws in order to allow miracles to occur. And they also argued that if we assume the existence of God, then miracles are just as possible as any other event.
and that it also makes sense to assume that God, unlike uh, the, the deist assumption, that God would want to reveal himself, which increases the probability that miracles occur and are identifiable as such. Miracles being events which we perceive with our senses, they can be supported using historical evidence just like any other event, and they cannot be refuted merely by appealing to the regularity of the laws of nature. And in response to Hume's in fact argument, the apologists disputed Hume's assessment of the evidence for miracles, which they found to be credible, or at least as far as the miracles of Jesus were concerned. So that's the historical background. Now onto the assessment section. Having described the arguments for and against accepting the occurrence of miracles made by some of the most influential philosophers and theologians of the last 300 years, how do you suppose Craig proposes to add anything of his own to this discussion? Well, if you guessed by appealing to quantum physics, you're right. Uh, the Newtonian world machine versus quantum physics is the next section of the chapter. And Craig says, quote, In quantum physics, there is an eradicable element of indeterminacy in the behavior of systems described by these laws. An elementary particle fired at a screen cannot be predicted to strike the screen at a specific determined point, as in Newtonian physics. Rather, there is a probability curve describing the various points where it might strike. Theoretically, the particle could end up anywhere. Now, since macroscopic objects, like a human body, for example, are composed of subatomic particles governed by quantum laws, there is some non-zero probability that each of the particles composing the body should travel to some distant location. And if all the particles did this, in concert, the whole body would be miraculously transported to another location. This would appear to bring some comfort to the modern defender of miracles, for he may now argue that it is illegitimate to exclude a priori a certain event that does not conform to known natural law, since that law cannot be rigidly applied to individual cases. Given quantum indeterminacy, there is at least some chance of an event's occurring, regardless of how bizarre it might be. Right after he says this, Craig takes a step back and admits that his half-assed appeal to quantum mechanics doesn't really get him anywhere since the laws of quantum mechanics are not the only laws that determine how matter behaves and occurrences that uh, violate the principles of other sets of laws, for instance, uh, relativity, uh, would still be impossible. And also, Craig admits that quantum indeterminacy only allows advocates of miracles to open a crack in the door, so to speak. Miracles are still exceptionally unlikely, even if they might be just barely possible. And he says, quote, We cannot sidestep the problem of miracles, then, by a disingenuous appeal to quantum indeterminacy or the statistical character of nature's laws. We are still confronted with the question whether violations of nature's laws are possible. Two things here before we move on from Craig's blindingly insightful and sure-footed presentation of quantum theory. Uh, first, quantum mechanics is one of the most complex and least grasped fields in the history of science. The people who know the most about it, the, the popular phrase is, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand it. And that comes from the people who most understand it in the world. Um, our understanding of it is nowhere near definitive. Uh, but one thing quantum mechanics is not, and will never be, is a license for religious apologists, most of whom neither know nor give much of a fuck about science, to declare that their treasured superstition is just as plausible as a well-demonstrated scientific fact, because anything is possible. Appeals to quantum mechanics, especially by people who know nothing about it, nor do they generally give fuck one about quantum mechanics are not evidence of anything. If I were to say to you, hey, guess what, I walked through a solid wall yesterday, and you were to say to me, no you didn't, people can't walk through solid walls, and I were to say, oh, well, quantum indeterminacy says that it's not impossible, 
you would still have no reason to believe me. You should absolutely doubt my claim because you can't just make an extraordinary claim and then appeal to quantum indeterminacy. You have to demonstrate it. And the more outrageous and unlikely your claim, the more powerful and persuasive and definitive your demonstration has to be if you want this claim of yours to be accepted as authentic. Second, by bringing quantum indeterminacy into this conversation in the first place and using it to validate, at least in principle, the occurrence of incredibly unlikely events, Craig has unwittingly provided us, I think, with a very powerful argument for dismissing virtually all claims of miracles ever made anywhere, anytime. Look at what Craig says again. He said, quote, it is illegitimate to exclude a priori a certain event that does not conform to no natural law. Given quantum indeterminacy, there is at least some chance of an event's occurring regardless of how bizarre it might be. What I'm saying is if, in other words, anything, no matter how fantastically unlikely, is possible, then there are no miracles. I think it might be helpful at this point to actually uh, define exactly what a miracle is. The thought apparently never occurred to Craig, the professional philosopher and master debater, because he never quite does. He sort of skirts around it. He proposes various possible definitions for miracles in given contexts, but he never actually sits down and writes out explicitly and definitely what he is talking about when he says a miracle. Uh, he seems to mean an act of God, an instance of, of divine action, but this doesn't strike me as a very useful definition because it's way too vague. It leaves too much room for natural occurrences to be falsely identified as miracles. And I think if we want a practical definition of miracles, we need a definition that will allow us to identify miracles as opposed to incredibly unlikely natural events that we might otherwise falsely identify as miracles. So I looked it up and uh, Merriam-Webster has two definitions of miracle that would seem to suit our purposes. The first definition is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs and the second definition is an extremely outstanding or unusual event thing or accomplishment. Now, that's better than anything that Craig gives us in this chapter, but we're still left with this problem of distinguishing between an event that belongs in the category defined by that second definition, that is, an occurrence that is extremely unusual but nonetheless permitted by the laws of nature, and an event that belongs in the category defined by that first definition, which is an occurrence that is the result of the action of God. So if we want a useful definition of miracle, it seems to me that we should establish using that definition that in order to qualify as a miracle uh, a given occurrence must not only actually be the result of the action of God but that it must also be identifiable as such and this was one of the problems that Hume had of course uh, how can you ever know that a given event is an act of God and not merely an extremely unlikely event allowed by the laws of physics and the only way I can see around this problem is to define a miracle more narrowly as something that not merely could have been the result of the action of God, but an event that is impossible, that must have been the result of the action of God, could not have happened without God stepping in and making it happen. That is, to me, the most practical definition of a miracle that I can see, since anything that falls short of that standard could be explained as a natural occurrence and would therefore fall prey to Hume's in-principle objection. And I don't think that Craig would like this definition. I think it's too narrow for his purposes since it disqualifies the paltry miracles of Jesus, not to mention other so-called miraculous occurrences like faith healing that evangelicals love to jack off to. And there's also a big problem that I see with this definition, and not only with the definition, but with the whole concept of miracles. And uh, I think m my definition here actually illuminates this problem quite nicely. Um, it's difficult to craft a totally practical, meaningful definition of a miracle because even if we define a miracle as an impossible event, 
once such an event that we might imagine actually happens in reality, it becomes possible. If something is impossible, it doesn't happen, period. If something happens, then it is possible, and therefore it is not a miracle. So that leaves us with no possibility of miracles ever actually occurring. We can imagine them. We can define them as these impossible occurrences that nonetheless occur through the act of God. But if an impossible occurrence actually occurs, then it ceases to be impossible. And anyway, there's, there's more on that coming up here. So uh, back to our regularly scheduled program. Craig asks whether miracles ought to be considered violations of the laws of nature, and he says, quote, It would be well if we could rid ourselves of this characterization, since it is very prejudicial psychologically, smacking of the breaking of a civil law, so that God takes on the appearance of a cosmic criminal or divine rapist of Mother Nature. <laughs> and incidentally, I agree with Craig here. It is unfair to characterize miracles in such a prejudicial way, such that God appears to be a cosmic criminal. If he were real, the biblical God would certainly be guilty of the most horrific crimes against humanity ever committed, but cosmic crimes? I'm not even sure what they would be, and we have no evidence that God is guilty of any cosmic crimes. Also, uh, God is not a divine rapist of Mother Nature. He's a divine rapist of teenage virgins. Craig discusses the three main views of the laws of nature, of what they are and, and how they operate, and how they relate to the problem of miracles. First, there is the regularity theory, and this theory sees the laws of nature as descriptions rather than limitations of the workings of nature. According to this view, no event that occurs can ever said to be a violation of the laws of nature, since uh, the law would just be amended to include such events in that description. And Craig doesn't say this, but to me, the regularity view of natural laws actually, just as I was talking about a moment ago, eliminates miracles completely by definition. Uh, in much the same way that quantum indeterminacy does. If something happens that is unlikely, but nevertheless allowed to happen by the laws of nature, then in what sense is it meaningfully described as a miracle? Second, there is the gnomic necessity theory, which holds that the natural laws are laws which tell us what is possible and what is not possible. However, uh, laws under the gnomic necessity theory are not absolute. As with the regularity theory, the gnomic necessity theory gives us natural laws that are up for revision at all times should an event previously held by them to be impossible be found to actually occur. And again, under this theory of natural law, I don't see how any definition of miracle could possibly have any meaning at all. Now, Craig argues that uh, acts of God do not violate the laws of nature, nor do they require the laws of nature to be revised. And he says, quote, if God brings about some event which a law of nature fails to predict or describe, such an event cannot be characterized as a violation of a law of nature, since the law is valid only under the tacit assumption that no supernatural factors come into play apart from the natural factors. The miracle described there actually sounds something like the miracle I described when I proposed my practical definition a minute ago, an event that isn't predicted or described by a law of nature. But it's not quite the same thing, because as stated by Craig in that quote, the event in question could be the sort of thing that uh, Spinoza mentions in one of his objections, which is a natural event that appears to be a miracle due to the limitations in our knowledge and our understanding of nature. And Craig suggests that within the context of uh, regularity theory and uh, gnomic necessity theory, miracles be defined as naturally impossible events. And where have I heard that before recently? But as I said, since both theories hold that natural laws are determined by what happens and not the other way around, there can be no meaningful definition of a miracle. And Craig argues that miracles in this sense could be uh, relative to time and place. That, for instance, in some contexts, rain would be a natural and inevitable phenomenon, and in others it might be impossible. But the fact that rain occurs 
in a situation that it was thought to be impossible for rain to occur establishes that it is possible. And according to Craig, both regularity theory and gnomic necessity theory require that we should amend our laws of nature to uh, include such occurrences, to take miraculous rain into account. And Craig also suggests that some events, such as the resurrection of Jesus, might be what he calls absolutely miraculous, meaning that they are naturally impossible in every time and place, no context necessary for them to be considered miraculous. But he runs into the same problem. If the resurrection of Jesus actually occurred, then by Craig's description of both regularity and gnomic necessity theory, the laws of nature would have to make room for such an event to occur because the laws of nature don't determine what happens. What happens determines the laws of nature. Finally, Craig comes to the third view of the laws of nature, and that is uh, causal dispositions theory. This theory holds that everything has a nature that causes it to tend to do certain things. And the example Craig cites is uh, salt dissolving in water. Uh, when God acts, he is impeding the causal disposition of a thing, but he is not fundamentally altering it, uh, which means that no law of nature has been violated. In other words, if God steps in and stops salt from dissolving in water, uh, he is only impeding that salt's causal disposition in that instance. Salt, in general, still dissolves in water, and that principle holds, and that remains a reasonable expectation for people to have about what happens when salt is introduced into water. And Craig says, quote, On none of these theories, then, should miracles be understood as violations of the laws of nature. Rather, they are naturally or physically impossible events events which at certain times and places cannot be produced by the relevant natural causes. 200th verse, same as the first. Impossible events are events that don't happen. If something happens, it's not impossible, it's possible. Craig says, quote, Now the question is, what could conceivably transform an event that is naturally impossible into a real historical event? Clearly, the answer is the personal God of theism. No, clearly the answer is nothing. Now Craig moves on to specifically address the uh, cases made by Spinoza and Hume. He starts with Spinoza and he begins with Spinoza's objection based on the immutability of nature. Craig argues that the laws of nature are not known by God necessarily. In other words, the laws depend on God's will and need not necessarily be what they are. And if God has the power to will natural laws into existence, then he also has the power to will miracles that allow events prohibited by those natural laws to transpire, since both natural laws and miracles are the product of God's will, and therefore miracles are not in conflict with natural law. As for Spinoza's objection based on the insufficiency of miracles, Craig argues by just denying Spinoza's assumptions that proof for God's existence must be certain. Spinoza felt that proof for God's existence must be certain. The proof must require that God exists. And also Spinoza argued that God's existence is inferred by the existence of these regular constant natural laws. Uh, to be compelling, Craig says, arguments for God's existence need not establish God's existence as a certainty, but merely as more likely than not. Uh, Craig also points out that there are many arguments for God that don't rely on the existence of the natural laws, and he cites the ontological argument and the cosmological argument as, as two examples of this. And I actually, again, I, I agree with Craig. Uh, I don't think the existence of God can be inferred from the existence of natural laws. I think that's a bad argument, uh, but of course I think that the ontological and the cosmological arguments are shitty arguments too. So. So what then of Spinoza's objection on the grounds of the difficulty of identifying miracles? Well, Craig argues that we can assume a miracle has taken place if it is momentous, that is, for instance, if a, a sick person is healed, as Jesus says, be clean, um, if the event does not regularly recur in history, but yet it does recur often enough and in enough variations that we can assume that it is neither just a freak natural occurrence or the result of some 
never before identified natural process. And then Craig says something absolutely extraordinary. He says, quote, since, as we shall see, most critics now acknowledge that Jesus did perform what we may call miracles, this answer to Spinoza seems to be a cogent defense of the supernatural origin of the gospel miracles. Most critics acknowledge that Jesus performed miracles? The next chapter in this book is titled The Problem of Historical Knowledge, and I assume that uh, Craig will be addressing this further there, but for now, most critics, can anyone name me a scholar who is a critic of Christianity who believes that Jesus actually worked miracles? Can you name me a single person? At first glance, that quote strikes me as the most disgracefully dishonest thing that William Lane Craig has ever fucking said, and that is saying something. What about Jesus' greatest miracle, his own resurrection, uh, following the crucifixion? Well, Craig says, quote, The question is, if Jesus actually did rise from the dead, would we then be justified in inferring a supernatural cause for that event? I know of no critic who argues that the best explanation of the historical facts is that Jesus rose from the dead, but that his resurrection was no miracle, but a perfectly natural occurrence. That would appear to be a somewhat desperate obstinacy. Of course, the reason that critics don't argue that the best explanation is that Jesus rose from the dead in a natural, non-miraculous way is that they don't assume, as Craig does in posing the question, that Jesus rose from the dead at all. The best explanations are the ones that don't require the assumption that Jesus actually rose from the dead at all. Now Craig moves on to Hume's objections, beginning with the in-principle argument, uh, quote, Hume confuses the realms of science and history that dead men do not rise is a generally observed pattern in our experience, but at most it only shows that a resurrection is naturally impossible. That's a matter of science, but it doesn't show that such a naturally impossible event has not in fact occurred. That is a matter of history. Yes, and history tells us that there is no reason to assume that dead Jesus rose. But uh, back to science for a minute, because I love when Craig presumes to make these authoritative pronouncements about science, which is a subject that he clearly knows fuck all about. If science shows us that something, say a resurrection, is naturally impossible, but we are nonetheless willing to admit the possibility given supernatural intervention, then what exactly does it mean for us to label something impossible at all? If you're willing to accept supernatural explanations for supposed miraculous occurrences, then doesn't the concept of impossibility lose all of its meaning? What does scientifically impossible mean to William Lane Craig? Because even if he accepts that a given occurrence is naturally impossible or scientifically impossible, he will still be willing to believe that it occurred provided that he can convince himself that God had something to do with it. And he doesn't seem to take much convincing. On to Hume's in fact arguments. Uh, Craig argues that Hume's in fact arguments don't rule out miracles occurring in history, but merely remind us to be cautious in our investigations of possible miracles. And as for Hume's point about all religions making contradictory miracle claims, Craig says, quote, it still remains an empirical question whether the evidence for any miracle supporting a counter-Christian claim is as well or better attested as the evidence for Jesus' miracles and resurrection. And if the latter should prove to be genuine, then we can forego the investigation of every single counter-Christian miracle, for most of these pale into insignificance next to the gospel miracles. Yes, apologists in training, investigate the miracles of Jesus, and once you've proven those to be authentic, just stop. No need to investigate the claims of other religions, even though demonstrating that things like spontaneous healing and uh, magical multiplication of food and resurrection and transfiguration into a radiant and perfect spirit body actually did occur would seem to lend credence not only to Christianity, but to all faiths that make similar claims and thus demand 
further investigations, not only of Christianity, but of all those other religions, never mind, forget that, don't do that. Stop with Christianity, because remember, the purpose is not to discover the truth, whatever it may be. The purpose is to argue for Christianity. That is your purpose as an apologist, to rationalize, to skew and distort science and history to Christianity's benefit, to defend it against all challenges, especially facts that flatly contradict its claims and render it impossible for any honest, rational person to believe. Remember, scientists start with questions. Apologists start with conclusions. That's it for chapter four. I'll be back in the next video with a look at chapter five, which is titled The Problem of Historical Knowledge. As always, I so, so, so greatly appreciate uh, all of you watching and taking the time to leave comments and send me messages about this stuff. It's incredibly gratifying. I can't tell you how gratifying it is, uh, except that I kind of just did. Uh, to know that these videos and this subject and all this stuff is of some use and of interest to people other than myself. Uh, so thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.